Welcome to News in Context. I'm Gina Valeria. In this episode, we talk with former San Francisco DA Chase Aboudin, founding executive director of the newly created Criminal Law and Justice Center at UC Berkeley School of Law. We discuss Boudin's new role at UC Berkeley and his plans for advancing victims' rights, true justice for all, and criminal justice reform by seeking evidence-based solutions and researching what can work. We also explore how we could truly reform the U.S. criminal justice system to make it work for everyone and how to navigate resistance to reform efforts. This is part one of my interview with Chase Boudin. You can hear part two next week. So the reason I wanted to have you on here today was really to kind of die. I mean, one, I'm so excited to hear about the center because I think watching everything that's gone down in San Francisco with you and across the country, it's time to really sort of dive in and and provide context around these issues or more context, additional context around these issues, as well as like what keeps derailing efforts to reform criminal justice or really get at some of the per- pernicious and persistent issues uh, in the system. So I guess what, I, what I'd like to start with is to have you talk a little bit about, first, about the center and what you would like to focus on doing the, this work. Well, thanks for having me on the show and giving me an opportunity to talk about my work and issues that have so impacted my life and the lives of countless millions of Americans. Um You know, I grew up visiting my own parents in prison, and maybe we'll have a chance to talk about that later on in the recording. But it's meant for me that every every day of my life, I'm thinking about and aware of and cherishing my own freedom, as well as impacted by the shortcomings of the way that this country approaches crime and punishment. I think we can all agree that regardless of our politics or our priorities, that we all deserve to live in safe communities and that our country should continue to strive to live up to the really lofty goals that many of our founding fathers set forth in terms of equal justice under law, in terms of having an independent, neutral judiciary that meets out justice, and in terms of having a system of justice we can call just. And we've got a lot of work to do if we're going to achieve those goals. I think our our current approach is failing. It's failing to rehabilitate people. It's failing to keep communities safe or to meaningfully uh, support victims who have been harmed by crime and violence. And it's also bankrupting state and local governments, starving them of the resources that are necessary to actually prevent crime, to build the kind of vibrant communities that I want to raise my son in. Um, And so this job for me is a really exciting next step in a career, a a lifelong journey uh, that's been dedicated to finding ways to decrease reliance on incarceration as a response to social problems, ways to expand resources that can actually help people who've been harmed heal, and break the cycle of recidivism, of of arrest and release and arrest that is so destructive to families and to communities and to safety. How does engaging in this work in a place like UC Berkeley differ from doing it uh, in a government setting, local or regional government? Law schools are kind of unique in that they're at a kind of the intersection of scholarship and practice. And the work I'm going to be doing at the center is is really at that intersection. It's going to draw on my practical experience both as a public defender and as the elected district attorney of San Francisco, as well as my lived experience visiting my biological parents in prison for a combined 62 years. Um, You know, so much of lawmaking and and legal teaching is often divorced from real world experience. And I want to bring all of the lived experience, all of the practical experience that I have in my lifetime Um, I want to bring that lens to the research we do, to the teaching. And what we're going to do at the center is three things. We're going to research, we're going to educate, and we're going to advocate. Um, And I'm happy to talk more about what that looks like. But but at core, we're going to dig in on um, what sorts of policies can um, make us safer. What are more effective ways to invest tax dollars that are being dedicated to public safety? Um, What are ways that we can expand access to justice and enhance the integrity of law enforcement so that people trust the system when they need to ask for help or have a loved one being processed through the system. Um, We're going to educate the next generation of lawyers, of of, of public defenders, of prosecutors, of judges, um, and we're going to advocate for policies that make our communities safer, more just places to live. 
I want to get into all of that, but I want to start, I want to dial back just a second. And everyone says they want safe communities, no matter what side of the political spectrum they're on. Uh, Everyone says they want justice, things like that. So I was wondering if you could define what does a safe community mean to you or what does a safe community look like to you? That's a great question. And I think that uh, really at the heart of a lot of the debates we have locally and nationally is this question of safety for who and what is safe. Um, You know, for me, I think in an ideal world, we'd live in a society where people don't have to have fear that they would be personally harmed physically or that their property would be harmed. Um, You know, I'm raising a two year old and one of the golden rules and one of the many parenting books that I read um, that is encouraging, you know, unstructured free play in some ways has applicability to answering your question. And and the rule is basically um, if it doesn't harm people or property, then it's probably okay. And so I'd want to live in a society where what we think about as safety is we don't need to be in fear that our persons or property are going to be harmed or taken from us or uh, those of our loved ones. And um, I think we have a long way to go to get there when it comes to public safety and and big cities across the country and and beyond. But I also think we need to ask an important question, which is who's safety? And often the kind of things that make the news, you know, for example, we saw this in San Francisco recently where a wealthy tech executive was tragically stabbed to death. And it was international news. It was every major paper in the country and around the world was covering it. It was endless uh, TV and radio and analysis. Um, He was one of more than a dozen people who'd been killed by that point in the year. And none of the other people who were killed got anywhere near that level of attention. And so this is not in any way to minimize the horror and the loss to his family um, or of his life. It's simply to point out that when we talk about safety, we really have very unequal allocations of resources of of prioritization. I mean, to to take another extreme, um, look at the way that so many people minimize and denigrate the value of of physical safety to immigrants or to, um, to women or to uh, people who are poor or unhoused. And I think um, ideally we live in a community where everybody is safe, whether they live in a mansion or whether they live in a tent, whether um, they are tourists visiting our city or whether they are people who were born and raised here. You know, we want to have safety and justice for all. I think that's sort of the promise of our democracy and of our system of laws. And we're falling really short of that when it comes to safety for so many different groups, social groups, people who have different gender identities, people who are themselves incarcerated. Um, Often people just don't care about their safety, but we know that rape and violence against incarcerated people um, is a very, very uh, serious problem, pervasive problem, and one that affects everybody's safety ultimately. Thank you. I appreciate that. And then the other thing I'd like to define before we move on is that term justice. What does justice mean to you when you're saying that's what you want to pursue? Well, I think it's a, a system of laws. And, you know, we have, I'm a lawyer. I went to law school. Uh, I come from many generations of lawyers and, and legal practitioners, judges. Um, and I think the rule of law is a delicate and fragile thing. And if we start having two systems, you know, one for the rich and powerful or one for the police and one for everybody else, I think we do real damage to the rule of law. I think we undermine the notion of justice. So, you know, there are countless policies uh, and practices that I could give you examples of that are blatantly discriminatory, you know. And um, I think when we, when we see that, when we see uh, police getting away with murder or when we see corrupt politicians um, getting away with embezzlement or, um, you know, any number of other things that we know are sadly commonplace in this country, in this city, you know, I think that does real damage to the rule of law and it undermines uh, the sense of justice. At a national level, we're kind of all, all reeling from revelations about corruption at the Supreme Court and Justice Thomas going on uh, trips that are worth many tens of thousands of dollars with billionaire Republican donors uh, with people who have cases pending before his court and not disclosing those. And, you know, th- those are examples of things that really undermine the public trust in the legal system, in the judiciary, and our sense of justice. Yeah, I agree. And when it's mentioned, it's always like, oh, you're being partisan. And, and it's like, no, we really want to get at this issue and, and fix things and solve it and make sure there is justice for all, as you say. So in that sense, why do you think, and, and again, I know the center is going to be doing a lot of this work and a lot of the research and trying to pull data and evidence together. But at this moment, as you begin your foray into the center, why do you think these issues persist? I mean, you've been a practitioner, you've you've been inside the system, you've you've obviously paid tons of attention and you've been thoughtful about it. What What's going on in that we have these persistent issues that every time someone like you comes in to maybe 
look at things a little differently or in Alameda County or across the country, that there's sort of a, a real strong pushback against them. Love to get your, your thoughts uh, standing at this moment. Well, change is hard. And we can all agree that our justice system is falling short, that our public safety uh, investments are falling short of what we deserve, what we want for our communities. And yet it can be really difficult to agree on how to affect that change and what it should look like. And, you know, that's particularly true. I, I think it's true across the board. It's true when it comes to climate change. It's true when it comes to, you know, any number of issues you might look at, public transit, housing, education. But it's particularly true when you're dealing with something that at, at its core, you know, is really scary. You know, public safety, crime. Um, anybody who has been a victim of crime, anybody who is concerned about being a victim of crime has a certain level of fear. And fear can sometimes make us uh, act in ways that are irrational. It can make us uh, react and rather than respond. And it can also um, lead to what we call fear mongering. And I think what we're seeing, again, across the country in every jurisdiction where, whether it's a district attorney or whether it's a mayor, whether it's a board of supervisors, uh, a police commission that's saying, hey, we can do better. We need more metrics. We need more accountability. Um, let's look at data. What we're seeing is police unions, often uh, correctional officer unions, sometimes local media, sometimes other elected officials, um, responding in ways that are are really based on fear, not on data. Um, we had an example of that just this past week in San Francisco, where a member of our board of supervisors who is responsible for the Tenderloin District, a very uh, challenging district to govern, um, where there's lots of open-air drug markets and drug overdoses, and also our highest concentration of families with school-aged children. Um, and the mayor had announced that she was ordering the police to start arresting drug users for the first time in well over a decade, um, at a time when we don't actually have adequate services for people who want to get sober. And when the mayor had just closed a safe consumption site that was preventing overdoses from becoming fatal. And so the supervisor asked if there was data supporting this decision to start arresting drug users. And instead of responding with data, if there was any, um, the mayor played a race card and, and said she was tired of white people asking those questions. Um, and, you know, you say, look, race is, is certainly relevant in the criminal justice system. We know it plays a, a, a role in, in the outcomes. And yet to suggest that data is therefore irrelevant or that white people in elected office can't ask questions about policy related to their district is really destructive to any kind of irrational policymaking process. And, and so I, I say all that as an example of why we have challenges implementing good policy, because there are people who are determined to defend the status quo, the war on drugs, for example, um, without regard to data, without regard to best practices or evidence-based practices, because it's in their interests. And I think that's certainly true for police unions, for many elected mayors, and for a lot of the people who are bankrolling the kinds of campaigns that we see attacking uh, people who are simply trying to do things better than they've been done before. And that, that term in their interest, I always marvel at that because it feels like it would be in all of our interest to have sort of vibrant communities across the board. And I know that sometimes there is also sort of the neighborhood, like I want it taken care of now. And so I can see you know, maybe the mayor trying to respond to, let's get something done now. Well, now I can arrest people. That's the only thing I have. That's the only tool I have, rather than a long-term goal, which isn't as visible to someone who's living there and seeing a problem or wanting a problem addressed. I'll just push back a little bit. I mean, look, certainly I, I mean, I, I, of course, I agree that there are different lenses of analysis. There's different time frames, And often there's not a clear or easy answer. We don't, for example, have a, a magic bullet to solve homelessness. We don't have a magic bullet to solve mental illness. Those are problems that we can address. Uh, we probably can't ever in our lifetimes entirely solve them. And so, yeah, it's 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 sometimes, you know, a, a, a gray area where you say, well, we could try this or we could try that. Arresting people who are addicted to drugs is not a gray area. That's an area where we have decades worth of it. And, I, and I'm not suggesting, by the way, that it's okay or we should simply throw our hands up and do nothing about open air drug use. I am saying using the police as a frontline response to a public health crisis has been tried in cities across the world for decades. And we know what the results are. 
The results are abysmal. They're inhuman, they're expensive, and they distract police from doing the critical work that they are uniquely suited to do, responding to violent crime in progress. So from my perspective, um, these are choices. These are choices in the short, medium, and long term about where to invest money. And there's been a very intentional decision in San Francisco and other cities across the country not to invest in drug treatment, not to invest in housing for people who are unhoused, not to have adequate shelter beds or mental health treatment beds. Those are things that, yes, can't happen overnight. But you know what? You can't have enough police to arrest every drug user in the Tenderloin overnight either. That is also a long-term investment. It's one that our mayor has said she's willing to make. Meanwhile, she's not willing to invest in the treatment, right? And, and this is something that I was calling for back in 2019 when I was on the campaign trail. I saw it day in, day out as a public defender before I ran for DA. You're listening to News in Context. I'm Gina Valeria. We are talking with former San Francisco DA, Chesa Boudin, founding executive director of the newly created Criminal Law and Justice Center at UC Berkeley School of Law. Our jail in San Francisco, like so many jails across this country, has tragically become the number one provider of mental health services. Let me just say a piece about why that's tragic, because it's not just San Francisco, it's LA, it's, it's big cities across the country. It's tragic because it means we are waiting until someone commits a crime before we intervene in a way that gets them help. That means we're waiting for there to be a victim of crime. We're allowing people to be victimized by folks who desperately need services, but we're not offering or making those services accessible until they're in a, a jail cell. The other reason it's tragic is because we know that jails are the worst place to give people mental health services. People are not inclined to engage or to respond favorably to medication or to treatment when they're in a cage. Yeah, that's a total stress. And clearly your message resonated with a, a, lot, a lot of us. I mean, I, I, you know, as a journalist, that message resonates. It's res it resonated when we elected you in San Francisco. It resonated in Alameda. It, that message resonates and people do want to see these things uh, come to fruition. So I was listening to, a, I, I believe it was a forum episode, and they were talking about safe drug use sites and the, the veto for, at the state level. Um, and there was a woman on the panel from Canada, and she was listening to everyone else who's from the United States talk about, well, we need data, we need this, we need that. And, she's, and she laughed, and she said, God, Americans, there is data. There's data from across the world. Why? She's like, that's very clear, basically making the exact same point you made, that, that the data does exist, and it does clearly show that safe drug use sites work for in this case, and that there are options. Let's turn back to the center and talk a little bit about uh, how, you know, you're, you're going to educate, you're going to advocate, you're going to research. And those things are, are hugely important. How are you going to direct the messaging to really help um, turn the tide on some of the public perception that drives the pushback um, in a way that might, that might move the needle on this? Well, first of all, you know, as you say, we have lots of data. And sometimes what resonates more with people is what they see in their Twitter feed or, or what's coming up in Google News. Um, and there's not always a correlation. So, for example, during my administration, overall reported crime was down by 20%. Um, and that was true for violent and nonviolent crimes. We actually saw, um, and you know, I'm just looking at the numbers here, but we saw in the two and a half years I was in office, compared to the two and a half years prior to when I was in office, we saw more than 30,000 fewer reported crimes. And that's according to the San Francisco Police Department. And yet many residents felt less safe. Why is that? One reason for that was the pandemic and a dramatic change in how we lived our lives. Another was probably a really significant increase in headlines focusing on crime. And I think it's critical that we not just be safe, but that we also feel safe. And so that's where the communication angle comes in. I think it's where, frankly, local media, national media has a role to play and the way that crime gets covered, how much it gets covered, how much particular elected officials are being named in stories. All of that comes into play, I believe. Um, and there's also a role, I think, for a center like the one that I lead to play in, in that. How do you see the center playing a role? If we're doing deep number crunching, for example, if we're doing an analysis of the success of a, a new program, just to pick one, which was the first kind of policy I implemented when I was district attorney, which was primary caregiver diversion. So the year before I took office, our state legislature passed a law called primary caregiver diversion. Our governor signed it into law. And as district attorney, my first policy and San Francisco 
as a result, was the first in the state to actually implement this new law. And it's a law that says, fundamentally, we recognize that sometimes it's better for everybody if parents who've been arrested for low-level crimes are at home taking care of their kids than if they're in jail racking up criminal convictions. And so we're going to create opportunities, diversion opportunities, um, for people to take parenting classes and engage with other kinds of court-supervised programming. And if they're successful, we're going to dismiss the case. If they're not successful, criminal case is still pending. But we want to create these off-ramps for people who are playing this critical role of, of being caregivers and hopefully prevent kids from ending up in foster care, hopefully break this intergenerational cycle. Um, and so, you know, we implemented that, that policy in San Francisco. It's now been more than three years since the law took effect. And as far as I'm aware, there have been no studies of its effectiveness. So let's say that my center is able to gather data from all the counties across the state. Have they implemented it? How many people have gone there? What was the success rate? Um, now, a few years later, how many of those people were rearrested, if any? We could do that data analysis. We could publish a report on it. And that's something I'd love to do. It's also going to be important to communicate and to tell the stories behind the data. Because we all know, and, and you know this from your work as a journalist, that as, as significant as data is, as, as necessary as it is to good policymaking, stories, human interest is also unbelievably compelling. And if we have one without the other, we're either going to People's eyes are going to glaze over. They're going to be suspicious of the source of the data, or they're going to see some other report that crunches numbers differently, and they're going to throw up their hands and say, well, I don't know. Maybe Trump did win the election. I mean, right, that's – and this is Steve Bannon's, um, one of Trump's strategists, uh, one-time strategists, um, whole approach. I mean, he said, flood the zone with shit. And they have done that very effectively to the point that data alone doesn't get us where it should. You need human stories. You need anecdotes that illustrate the data in a way that is memorable to people and compelling. So I think we have to do both things. I think we have to do that both as researchers and also as advocates. Yeah, I totally agree. We are seeing a lot of stories without data in the misinformation and disinformation campaigns that are effective because we do respond to stories. Uh, even I always use with my students. I teach also at Sonoma State and I, you know, uh, the Stalin quote, you know, one death is a tragedy, a thousand deaths or a million deaths is a statistic, right? Because it's so difficult it, that I can tell a story about that one person. But the rest of it just feels too large. And and I think, people, yeah, like you said, people's eyes glaze over or they don't know how to read it and they question it. And so um, so coming up with the stories and, and, and that's why I honestly started this podcast is to dive deeper into some of these big issues to provide context and to tell the story of the issue. Um, so I do appreciate that that's going to be part of your approach at the center. Um, and I'm wondering how you found your way to the center between the recall, which that moment to hear, can you talk to me a little bit about how you found your way to this center that, that seems to be very suited for for what you can do and, and be? I was excited to deliver on the promises I made to voters. I knew it was going to take more than a year, um, but I was within a year, I was facing two separate recall attempts and um, certainly wasn't counting on the COVID pandemic, but I, I was counting on it being a long-term job, at least four years, the four years I was elected to. Um, so it was frustrating, of course, not to get to finish my term. I also went through a lot on a personal level in the final year in office, not just fighting the recall, losing uh, my job to which I'd been elected, but also the birth of my first son. Uh, but also my, my father got out of prison after 40 years shortly before the recall. My mother uh, lost a seven-year battle with cancer just a month before the recall. Um, and so we were dealing with a tremendous amount on the home front, you know, as well as a, a very demanding job. And, and so when the recall was over, I really wanted to focus on family and take time to plan my mom's memorial, to support my wife in her career the way she'd supported mine, um, and to really get time with my son in a way that had been challenging when I was running the office and fighting the recall for the first um, nine months of his life. And so that was the priority. But I also started having conversations with people all across the spectrum at law firms and at universities and in other government agencies, you know, in a whole wide array in, in media. You know, the, the area of work that seemed most exciting to me was, was ultimately this, was something that could allow me to continue to do public facing advocacy work while also taking the time to really dig in on the data and the science. Um, because one of my frustrations during my time in office was that politics kept getting in the way of good policy. And I really like 
thinking about the issues on a deep level. I like studying the data. I like looking at points of comparison in other jurisdictions where they've implemented policies, seeing what's worked, what hasn't worked, why, and then trying to you know spread the love when we have a good policy, a model policy. And that was something that was just really challenging to do, um, partly the COVID pandemic, partly uh, internal sabotage in the office, partly um, you know the petty politics of City Hall and so many other issues. But um, and then, you know, the other thing that's so amazing about being at a place like Berkeley Law, the, the premier public law school in the country, is that I'm surrounded, you know, on the one hand by professors who are doing cutting edge research and publishing, um, really thinking outside the box about justice and safety and all of the related issues that come up with rule of law. Um, and also with an amazing, creative, high energy group of students who, you um, you know, are our future leaders, uh, elected officials and immigration advocates and tenants rights lawyers and so much more. And to get to work with and help shape the curriculum uh, for those students to teach them and to learn from them is just a really amazing opportunity. So, you know, after a lot of conversations with a lot of people, um, I saw that this center was being created at Berkeley Law. I knew a lot of faculty there um, and I was excited to apply and thrilled to get the job. Yay, that's awesome. Thank you to my guest, Chesa Boudin, founding executive director of the newly created Criminal Law and Justice Center at UC Berkeley School of Law. You can follow the new center on Instagram or Twitter at Berkeley Law CLJC. This has been part one of my interview with Chesa Boudin. In part two, we'll explore how our focus on punishment can actually undermine public safety. Sometimes we successfully punish people, but we actually undermine safety in the process. Um, all of that made me um, kind of start studying from an early age the uniquely punitive approach to, um, to justice in this country. And it also made me learn and study what's become called mass incarceration. I, I learned, for example, that the United States leads the world in locking people up, that we have more people per capita and as a pers- and, and in raw numbers incarcerated on any given day than any other country in the world. And that's that's not something we should be proud of, right? That's not, you know, we're not safer because of it. We're not uh, happier because of it. We're not more prosperous because of it. We'll also discuss how the criminal justice system reflects society in ways we need to address. One of the things I learned both personally visiting jails and prisons my whole life and being a public defender and you know, the practical experience of being in the courtroom, both as a public defender and running the district attorney's office is that for far too long the criminal legal system has been a dumping ground for other social problems and you know that's true true with regard to poverty homelessness addiction all kinds of issues right and we grapple with the emergence of two systems of justice and how that can impact young people as they go through life we want to make sure as a society that people are in an environment where they have the right choices to make and all too often, you know, people who look like me or people who go to private, you know, elite private schools, um, you know, they're making choices in an environment that's like a bowling alley with bumpers, you know, where you can bounce off the walls a little bit and it's safe and you get second and third and fourth chances. And people like my friend Lorenzo don't get those second chances. It doesn't mean that they didn't make bad choices or that there shouldn't be responsibility and accountability when they do. And so I think we need to look at like, yes, individual accountability and yes, individual decision making and yes, individual responsibility and yes, structural change to ensure that more young people are in an environment where they have good choices to make. Join me next week. Music in this episode includes Spring Fling by Track Tribe and The Heist by Silent Partner. In addition to hearing news in context every Friday at 8.30 a.m. and 6.30 p.m. on KSFP 102.5 in San Francisco, you can hear it on Spotify, Stitcher, Apple Podcasts, iHeartMedia, Google Play, Google Podcasts, Podbean, YouTube, and PRX. We're also on Facebook and Twitter at News in Context SF and on Instagram at News in Context. And you can find links to all of that at newsincontext.net. I'm Gina Valeria. Thank you for listening. Thank you.